Hey, Science Signs, and welcome to topic 1.5 of the Space Exploration Unit, uh, describing the position of objects in space. Um, the last two uh, videos, I discussed uh, stars in 1.3, and I discussed all the planets and the sun uh, and our moon and our solar system. And basically today's lesson, and it's a really going to be a really short one today, uh, is basically just here to, to show you how do you actually locate, how do you mark positions of these objects in the sky? Like if you're telling someone, hey, uh, you know, Betelgeuse, the star Betelgeuse is in, you know, is up in the sky right now. How would you give them information on how to find that, um, that object in the night sky? That's what today's discussion is about. And it will also tie in back to 1.2, where we discuss certain types of technologies that were used, including the Astrolab, the Quadrant, and the Cross Staff, all of which were designed to navigate uh, by stars at night. The, all of these uh, ancient uh, technologies are all reliant on the measurements that I'm gonna be discussing today. And those measurements are just as uh, relevant today as they would have been centuries ago when they were used by sailors or navigators to find their way around uh, in the middle of the night. So, how do we do it? Well, what we've got here is a diagram, and it's also the same diagram that's on your, your notes here. What I've got is I've got an observer, and I've got my ground here. And on my diagram, which I've done a little bit better than the one in the notes, I've indicated the positions north, east, west, and south which are basically located there. Uh, directly above the person would be that spot there. So the person was to look straight above them. That's right above them. And then, uh, yeah, that's sort of your orientation. Then you've got sort of this dome that would represent uh, the person's field of view at that position looking up uh, into the night sky. And at this position here, this red dot, this will be a star that we want to indicate the position of. So how would I measure where that star is in the sky? Well, there's two measurements that I'm going to use. One is called altitude and one is called azimuth. The altitude represents the angle from ground level that you're looking up. So if I'm basically looking out at the horizon and then I've got to look up this far, I would sort of measure the angle from the ground to the angle at which I'm looking up at the star. And that's what these devices that I mentioned, an astrolab, a quadrant, a cross staff, they're all designed to do that. They're all designed to make measurements, angle measurements of how high up a star is. So the altitude refers to how high the star is up in the night sky. Now, the maximum angle that you could have for a star using altitude would be 90 degrees. If a star was directly above your head, at the zenith, which is what's considered to be the top angle, if you're looking straight above you, that is called the zenith. If you have a star up there, then you're at essentially the highest angle at that point is 90 degrees. Because if this is my ground and I'm looking straight up, well, that's going to be a right angle. That's going to be a right angle relative to the ground. That's your 90 degree angle. So in this case, and I'm eyeballing it here, this star is roughly halfway between the zenith and the ground level, which would be essentially zero degrees. So let's just say that for this case, our altitude at this case is roughly gonna be 45 degrees. We're, we're eyeballing it here, but that's roughly halfway in between. You might wanna argue it's a little bit higher up this way, so maybe it's about 50 degrees or whatever. But if you were indicating to someone, you know, where is this star, you would say, okay, the star is at a altitude of 50 degrees. Okay, that makes sense. The problem is, where? Where is it going to be an altitude of 50 degrees? There's a 360 degree of angle around me, and I have to look up at a 50 degree angle uh, over a 360 degree angle around me. How am I going to narrow that down? Well, that's my second measurement. My second measurement is going to be known as my azimuth. And my azimuth is the, the position where I'm going to start looking up from. So... In this case, when I'm using the azimuth reading, I'm always going to orient myself toward the north first. So the north, and I do have it listed as zero right now as my ground position, but north is actually zero azimuth. And then I'm going to measure clockwise from my north zero degree 
azimuth uh, angle value. So east would be 90 degrees, south would be 180 degrees, and west would be 240, where if I came almost all the way back to north, I would be closing back in on 360, but obviously the highest value I would have would then be like maybe 359.9 degrees. That would be a star that is slightly left of north, but because I have to measure it in a clockwise fashion, uh, the measurement can't be, I can't go that direction. I have to go all the way around clockwise first. So in this case, um, where the observer is looking toward the horizon before they look up toward the star, it's somewhere between east and north. Again, I'm going to eyeball it, but again, that looks like it's roughly halfway between north and east. So again, my azimuth value in this case is going to be roughly 45 degrees off north. So that would be my azimuth value. So if you gave those two measurements to someone who knew what they were doing, they would know to orient north. They would make a 45 degree angle from north. At that point, they would start looking up until they hit 45 degrees up in the sky. And then they would be able to find that star or that planetary object that we're looking for uh, at that point. So those are the two measurements we can use, altitude and azimuth. And again, these technologies early on that navigators use would use these two values. Um, Speaking of azimuth, um, th there, there is something that we can relate to, not with just the stars, but we can also uh, see what the sun does. And we discussed this back in topic 1.1 when we talked about ancient uh, civilizations that were looking at stars and the sun in the sky and how they were looking at specific dates of the year. You might remember that I discussed the solstice, which are the two dates where the sun is either in the sky for the longest amount of time or the sun is in the sky for the least amount of time. In the northern hemisphere, the longest day uh, is is, uh, is the summer solstice, which is uh, June 21st, and the shortest day of the year is the winter solstice, which is December 21st. Well, you can actually you can tell that as the days get longer, that the path of the sun not only does the sun rise and set in different locations uh, as the as the days of the year progress, but you're also going to notice that the path of the sun is going to get higher or lower. The closer you get to the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere, the higher the path of the sun is. And the closer you get to the winter solstice, the lower the sun stays to the horizon uh, as you get closer to that winter solstice date. This path through the sky has a name, and it's kind of a weird one because we've already used the word elliptical in this unit, which refers to an oval uh, an, an oval orbit around an object like a planet around the sun. In this case, we're dealing with a word called ecliptic. Ecliptic is the name used to measure or to, to, to designate the path of the sun in the sky. So if you ever see that term ecliptic, it just refers to where the path of the sun is on any given day of the year. And again, the ecliptic of the sun is at its highest on the date in the northern hemisphere of the summer solstice, which would be June 21st, and it has its lowest path in the sky on the date of the winter solstice in the northern hemisphere, which is December 21st. Conversely, if you go to the southern hemisphere, as I've mentioned, the solstice dates are in reverse. The December 21st date is now the summer solstice, which means the ecliptic of the sun in the southern hemisphere is going to be at its highest. And in June 21st in the southern hemisphere, you're at your winter solstice, where the ecliptic of the sun would be at its lowest point of the year in the southern hemisphere. And obviously the northern hemisphere would be in reverse. So there you go. Those are the ecliptics. That's pretty much it for today. Really short lesson. I like them like that. That's really good. Uh, here's what you're going to do for me. You're going to do some questions Sorry, on... I'm you're going to do some questions on uh, 1.5. Uh, 1. And you're also going to do some review questions in preparation for your uh, your upcoming unit quiz on topics 1.1 to 1.5. So here you go. For 1.5, these are the questions I'd like you to do. Questions 1 to 4 on page uh, 405. And then I would like you to do some review questions for 1.1 to 1.5. These are going to be questions 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 13, 14, 16, and 18 on pages 406 and 407 of the Science in Action 9 textbook. 
That is it. Coming up next, as I just mentioned, you got a quiz coming up about this fairly shortly. I'll give you details about that in class. Uh, next time when you see me, we're going to start talking about topic number two in the space exploration unit. I'm going to be starting with technologies in space transport. How do we actually get up into the stars? How do we actually get outside of the Earth's atmosphere? That will be my discussion next day. Until then, thanks for tuning in and have yourselves a good one.